Thank you everyone for joining and welcome to our next webinar in our ISO series. A lot has happened since we last spoke and I'm delighted to be joined by two of my colleagues um, to talk about what we've been doing, what we've learned, what's happening across the industry and, and some things to look forward to um, over the coming weeks, months and, and maybe even years. My name is Adam Henker. I run our transaction banking coverage business for banks clients um, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Povey and, and Aid Smith. Um, before we get started, um, in terms of the topics and the agenda, just hand over quickly to, to Ian and Aid to introduce themselves. Ian? Yes, thank you, Adam, and pleasure to be here. So I'm Ian Povey, I'm the CIO of Payments Technology under the Payments of Centre uh, of Expertise for NatWest Group. And um, yeah, hello everyone, I'm Adrian Smith, or Aid Smith, and um, I am one of the um, payment tower leads, product leads for uh, payments within NatWest. Uh, work alongside my colleagues to um, to deliver um, our products and services to our customers. Thanks both and, and great to have you again, Aid, on, on, on this one and, and, de de and delighted to have you join us um, for the first time. Um, so as I referenced, a, a lot has happened. We've had two go live dates. The industry has been working hard for, for a number of years on this and, and it continues to work hard. But Ian, I'm very keen to, to start with you and, and get your reflections on the go-live dates this year and particularly any insights of, of things that you think have worked really well. Yes, thank you. And, and you know, let's not forget that the, the payments industry as a whole has flexed the muscle on, on migrations many, many years you know, and, and over many decades. So we always have some a lot of experience to lean on with regards to best practices as we look at securing outcomes, but also minimising or ensuring that there are no visible impacts to customers and, and to the flow of payments in itself. So when we reflect on the March and, and June uh, go lives for both you know, Swift Target 2 and also CHAPS more recently, you know, one of the key benefits of that has been the, the sheer openness of the industry to collaborate both around testing, but also when it comes to the, the Go Live event as well, to be well connected and ensure that we are protecting service within our organisations, but also uh, between each of our organisations as well. Where there had been um, minor niggles, certainly in March, you know, these were addressed pretty quickly and, and it really came down to that preparedness to, to work you know, together for what is a common goal and a common outcome. And that's, uh, I think, part of what will see us through in the, in the forward migrations as we move forward. The other aspect, though, from a, you know, what went well and I think what we need to continue to do more of is those dress rehearsals that we did with um, the Bank of England and for the CHAPS migration in the UK, because that really boosted the confidence not only for the, the central party, in this case the Bank of England, but also each individual participant, and that really does help uh, on what are quite complex migrations for each and every one of us. Thanks, Ian. Um, particularly, um, you referenced the UK and, and the CHAPS migration and, and clearly our standing and the UK payments um, ecosystem is so significant. Um, was there a big difference in terms of our approaches from, from, from March and CBPR Plus and, and Euro and, and versus CHAPS um, in June or, or did they play out quite, quite similarly in terms of our playbook? The playbook itself was quite similar. It's probably the delta was the preparation between the two. And and certainly the UK had learned from and, and had built on for the March migration. So again, I, I reiterate on the dress rehearsals, but also just uh, the, the amount of testing that was actually applied between the participation, the participants and and the centre, so the Bank of England. And, you know, the ecosystem is dependent on each other. And if we don't test the ecosystem end to end, then that's what actually adds risk to each of the, of the forward uh, programmes. So, again, the UK did a really strong job. But we've, let's not forget that many uh, people watching this webinar are representing countries or have access and business to countries around the world, even ourselves, mm -hmm. have been went live in, in Singapore last last year as well. So you know, we are able to draw on those learnings on a market by market basis, not just the UK. Thanks, Ian. Actually, that's a good segue in terms of dress rehearsals and, and, and lessons learned. And obviously, we've been through two go live. Um, uh, dates specifically that have heavily impacted us here at NatWest, uh, but keen to get your reflections on those 
lessons learned or, or, or any kind of specific insights that we can share to, to, to our audience dialing in? Um, yeah, certainly, Adam. And I think building on um, what Ian has said around the, you know, the preparedness around those dress rehearsals and what you take as learnings from one dress rehearsal to the next. Um, Cleve, if you look at dress rehearsal one back in February, where we're doing from a test environment to test environment perspective, there's a lot we could learn from how to um, inject payments um, into the, you know, the infrastructure, the wider infrastructure, and assess the results of those. When you get to do that in, in production, a lot more coordination uh, and clarity with the Bank of England and others about how you do that um, was, was critical. Um, but also ensuring that you're very clear on timings, you don't you, know, you don't move away from that, so you increase, in, incur delay across the weekend as well. Um, you know, none of us were to be on the naughty step with the Bank of England, and uh, thankfully we, we weren't, so we, we, we did a great job there. Um, the other thing I think we learned definitely from March that we really took into um, the June cut over chaps is around static data across the industry. Um, and a big learning there was um, working with SWIFT and with the Bank of England to ensure that from their perspective, um, the static data that was being used across the industry and that also we were using in both test and also live proving um, over those cutover weekends was, um, was consistent all the way through. Um, that meant we went through the June cutover weekend with you know, the minimal, if no issues that we, uh, that we actually experienced. Um, so that's kind of how we get into June to make sure things happen they should do. Um, we also had to prepare for the eventuality of where things may not go to plan, not just from a NatWest perspective as well, but working with our, our clients, but also um, with other participants as well. So running through what our contingency options are, you know, what if we had a problem? How would we get customers' payments to flow through? How could we shift from um, CHAPS payments to ask our customers to um, move those over to faster payments across all of our customer types as well, um, but also how we could support um, other participants who may have issues as well. So a lot of coordination with the Bank of England to make sure that we could uh, we could achieve that if we had to, and um, thankfully we didn't, but we had to be prepared to do so. Thanks, Ian. So it's a really a strong sense of collaboration, pre-syndication, testing, and, and really strong governance and heightened alertness around it as you'd expect and I think we be quite um, proud of what, what the industry has, has achieved over the last few months and years. Um, building on that significant amount of investment, um, it, we know at institutional level, at industry level, at systems level and as ever it as seems to be the case in, in payments, um, we ourselves also investing in new technology and, and the new of um, a vast amount of responsibility in, in that tech stack here at NatWest. Um, keen to get your perspectives on that journey um, and, and the implementation of those systems and then how that's being managed. Um, and, and, and again, lots of, um, I'm sure, um, of, of the audience uh, on the call are having similar journeys and considerations, particularly when we think about the, the, the longevity of some of these change. So, um, really keen to get your perspective on that, Ian. Yes, and this is a, a pretty critical topic, actually, because there is a danger when we look at message standards, in this case, ISO 222, that we fixate just on the standard itself, as opposed to what that really means to our technology architecture, our business processes and our operation centres that support that. So the way I articulate this is that whilst we are continuing multiple waves of ISO migrations for each individual payment scheme, be they domestic and or cross-border, we're actually preparing ourselves for a significant uplift in data, both structured and unstructured, and also the increased velocity of payments as they we see more payment schemes increasingly move to, to real-time, near real-time, or indeed instant, as we've seen in some countries around the world. Those behaviours and, and outcomes of the ISO agenda are really what's driving the technology need to move and advance and modernise. So for us, this is an end-to-end -end conversation. So right from our digital channels and our APIs that support third parties who connect to us, our customers, through to uh, the gateways that we then send and receive payments uh, with each individual scheme. 
the data payload conversation is something that is really critical in understanding uh, our capacity to support that, our ability to ensure that data is retrievable and accessible to each either control function, customer, or, or area of the bank that needs it in the right time. And so looking at new technologies that support the streaming of data in a real-time basis. Then we look at the, the engines that support uh, our individual schemes, and that's a critical part of ensuring that we're supporting the new message standard, absolutely, and, and the, the new data fields and the, the length of those data fields, which are changing, and, and supporting the business and communicating those changes either to the front end of the channels or indeed through to the customers themselves. We need to be able to uh, cater for that additional load as we move forward. So this isn't payments or just my world of, of NatWest. This is an end-to-end -end story and navigation for the group and indeed uh, flows out into the customer base as well. Thanks, Ian. And actually, that, that, that enhanced data and, 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 and so much more information being carried in, in, in kind of value chain of, of, of execution, um, a lot of the, the kind of customer or, or the, a lot of benefits from the new message standard, which we've talked about in these, in these webinars um, uh, over the last few sessions, I'm sure will start to be thought about more materially. Um, but also, you know, recognising even on this call, we'll have various customers you know listening in from direct participants to correspondent banks to indirect participants and agency banks to corporates aid keen to get your reflection now we are essentially in a a live environment of, of new message standards what do we start to what are we starting to see is that the customer impact and and, and what can customers start to expect and see um, th thanks, Adam. And, and again, I'll, um, I'll, I'll build from what Ian has, um, has just been through as well. So in the, in the stage we are currently at, I'd say most of the work is behind the scenes within the systems that um, we are, we are um, uh, transforming and um, you know, moving into our strategic, our strategic architecture. I think the things we will work with uh, with our customers is what does the future look like when we start to um, have that consumption of data um, very visible end to end. So, what you know, what does structured data mean for our customers? How will um, how are they able to use that in a better way? LEIs and purpose codes. How can how can they be used to improve the payment flow? What can we do with that data to um, su support efficiency of transactions um, through that as well? But also, when we get to areas where prioritisation is, is is required, how can we prioritise prioritise by those types of um, or those attributes? When we get to a point where we are sort of building through efficiency as well, um, for those who joined the webinar um, a few months back um, with the Bank of England uh, presenting, um, the example used was structured data, structured address data, and how that can improve efficiency. I think the example used was um, was uh, was Russia. Um, you could take a view that we've probably already coded for that and built that within tra our transaction monitoring systems, but that coding comes at cost and it comes at potentially, you know, an efficiency reduction because we've had to build that in. If you can make the um, data flow more efficiently through those systems, then you're speeding up the process and you're reducing the cost, et cetera. So one small example, but those are the sorts of things we would build on to build that kind of total, total picture as well. Um, so I would say at this stage, we are working that through, um, but we'll make it very clear what we need from our customers, what we will give to our customers, and make sure those communications are effective as we go through the, uh, you know, the next um, the next period. And that that period is you know is is, is a couple of years plus when we when we take into account all of the things that we'll be doing under our transformation journey. And I think that's really reassuring, actually, Abe, because I think there is a lot of work that is that is talked about and that has been seen, particularly by certain you know members of the industry, really skewed towards that direct participant and, 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 and swift user, um, user group, whereas what's actually starting to be seen or probably not seen more on the indirect participant space or, 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 or the corporate space is as a result actually of the fact that the use of enhanced data is still, you know, being you know, more realistic in the future and how that impacts, Ian, what you said in terms of the end-to-end 
um, uh, data within our con con customer channels. So I think the uh, it's it's a it's a it's a great reiteration that a lot has happened. You called it behind the scenes. Probably feels a, a little bit less behind the scenes for some members on the call who've been actively involved. But for for a lot of our customers, it will feel like that, given um, there hasn't been that you know clear, tangible difference to what they're seeing come through in their reporting or, or the asks of information within the payments that they're submitting, which will all come, as you say, um, uh, over the coming years, and um, particularly with some, some, some milestones for enhanced data next year. So, so very, so, so very reassuring, A, eh? thank you. Um, Ian, moving on to, to one piece, and, and, and it comes up over and over again when we talk to, to customers, particularly across the, the international space, is the interoperability as a result of this transition. Keen to kind of get your, get your views on that. Um, there's a little bit, obviously, more meat on the bones in terms of the reality of some standards and, 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 um, and, and obviously timelines and transition. Really, really keen to get your get your view on that. Um, one of the one of the one of the things that I think I've seen in terms of customer interaction and discussion is, um, which was one of the potential concerns when talking about much broader data, um, was you know moving from um, payment messages which had a certain number of fields to actually increasing that massively, um, to make things better and more efficient aid as you referenced in the long run, but still there's early days and there's truncation still in terms of what's transferring through the system. So you could argue maybe one step forward, two steps back initially. Um, so keen to kind of get your view on, on the interoperability piece and, and uh, recognizing it's still quite early days, you know, some confidence that we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, and this is a, a very big topic and, and, and one that I think has it's been years in the making and been probably going to take a few more years to resolve. So if we look at it from a, the Financial Stability Board, the FSB and the um, Committee of Payments and Market Infrastructures, CPMI, you know, the agenda there under the G20 is very much around the data harmonization and that interoperability point. And so when you when we start to unpack what that actually means, it also and, and we look at the forward migrations that we get to have, and you've already referenced that we've got, you know, the next stage of uh, of CHAPS work delivered next year. We've got uh, SEPA later this year, and indeed we've got MPA faster payments uh, afterwards as well. And that's just in the UK, let alone what's going on around the world. So the data harmonisation point to facilitate uh, interoperability is really going to have to step up, I, I believe, as a community around the quality of the data that's being initiated in payment message in the first instance, because that is part of where we start to see payment breaks anyway in today's world, um, as much as it is about scheme-to-scheme -scheme alignment. And, and that scheme-to-scheme -scheme alignment supports multiple agendas. One clearly is around resilience and resilience opportunities, but the other one is around how we can support the ecosystem from a fraud and, 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 and transaction monitoring capabilities and, and having that consistency of that data as we move forward. You used the word truncation there earlier, and we can see that happen in a couple of different models. One is a disconnect between message standards or interpretation of the same message standard. And we have that today, even with ISO 222, but also where we have different techniques to support migrations. So some institutions globally uh, are leveraging either central services from SWIFT for translation or have translation services in and of themselves. And it will depend on the libraries that each entity is using on how that impacts the messages they receive, assuming that message is of full quality in the first instance, and then um, how that flows through an end-to-end -end, uh, system. So it is a big topic. It's going to require more of that, as I said at the start of the call, collaboration, but also absolute focus to, um, to support, because it's not just the standard itself that needs to be harmonised. The data within the messages uh, need to continue to be focused on. And Ian, building on that, given that level of kind of collaboration requires kind of the, the onus to drive that, do you feel the industry is well prepared for that, 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 that you know, that, that the onus on that happening is strong enough and sits in the right places, keen to kind of 
given your broad industry engagement, both internationally but also in the UK, keen to kind of get your perspective um, on that on that collaboration and kind of the the infrastructure that drives that. Yeah, I, it, it's definitely a consistent conversation now. So I think that's a good thing. I think from an execution standpoint, we've got further to go. But I would argue that all of us on this call um, have access to the, you know, call it the data vectors, if you like. We, you know, the content theme is available to us now in our operation centres where we have payment breaks on, on, on sort of like the near-term fixes that we can add into the conversation. I think the other level is between the FMIs, so the financial market infrastructures, and, and domestic schemes because, you know, Let's remember that a lot of payments do cross schemes, whether it be, you know, swift through into domestic and, and vice versa. And so we need to look at that ongoing collaboration between that sort of central infrastructure, scheme management and standards, and, and more local or domestic um, level infrastructure as well. But maybe age, you've got, you've got some bills on that one. Yeah, th thank you, Ian. I think the, you know, the bill for me would be um, the... What's talked about as a common credit message when we you know, get into the detail of um, new payment architectures, outcomes, and the underpinning design for that. Um, what we must ensure across the industry, um, and from that west, we are uh, very much pushing for pushing this to um, to be a actual outcome. Is that you have that interoperability, you've got that common standard, and it is to field description, length, etc., rather than just in the uh, in the written standard. That will then ensure we've got the ability to be interoperable truly domestically but also as Ian said you know we can make sure we are able to um, hook together piece together those um, instant payment um, propositions that are becoming more prevalent across the industry and certainly from a, a UK perspective we see that with the introduction of instant payments in uh, in new payment architecture hopefully in around 2027 that sounds like a long way away there's an awful lot of work to be done to get there and uh, Ian, thanks for that. Clearly, a real driver to, to maximise the efficiencies, the international and the kind of cross scheme efficiencies that that, that, that this transition can um, can support. And uh, and as you say, NatWest has a big role to play in that, and, and we're certainly driving that discussion, which is which is great to hear. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, we've mentioned it a few times, enhanced data, we know it's coming, the Bank of England presented that. Um, a, it'd be great just to get your perspective on where we are at in that journey um, and, and what, we, what we may have planned and, and how we're thinking about it. So um, I cover kind of, kind of two, two different sort of topics on this one. It's one, how do we make sure we can derive the data where we need to? How do we make sure we are clear where we require the data to be presented to us by our customers when they initiate initiate payments? Um, but then also, as I touched on a little bit earlier, how do we make sure the benefits kind of flow on that use of data um, within the bank and for our customers? You then have a se separate stream, which is how, how are we making sure that what we do is accretive for our customers in the bank in terms of benefits? So how are we creating the opportunities and working through what those opportunities are um, and we'll be coming out to our customers more with some sort of focus groups, um, pain points, you know, the usual type of activity you'd expect to um, to work through in this. Um, but that's between now and say the next next twelve months. Because what we have to be in a position is to be able to build those things. Should we take the opportunity to do so, and make sure they're kind of sitting in in kind of work stacks, not just within the bank, but with our customers as well. Because you know this has got to be end to end. Interesting item to hear if, um, if if our customers are you know providing any insight as well that we can you know we can take in uh, immediately. Yeah, certainly it's definitely a, a conversation topic in our meetings with banks here in the UK and internationally, and we see we're 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 leading up to to Cybos in a few weeks. All three of us will be there, and I'm sure many people listening to this call will be there as well from from the international community. So certainly something that is starting to be thought being thought about now we know what that message standard looks like and particularly in the uk what's coming down the line in chaps and and, and certainly a, a significant amount of work to do to gather that data and you know embed it into the into the new message so um, i'm sure we will have the opportunity to, to be discussing that over the coming weeks and months and also sharing 
um, you know, ha- our thinking. Um, but definitely, to, to Ian's earlier point, another way for us clearly to collaborate across payments to, to, to improve the efficiencies and really capitalise on the benefits of such a large-scale transition. Um, maybe finally moving to Cybos. Um, like I said, we'll all be there and look forward to, to meeting some of, some of the, um, the people I'm sure that are dialed in there. Keen, Ian, A, to get your kind of your, 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 your wish list or anything that you'll be specifically looking out for, given the platform that it creates in terms of um, discussion. Ian, maybe starting with you. Yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, Toronto again for my second Cybos in Toronto. Uh, apart from the, the sheer scale of the venue, uh, but look, you know, the themes uh, that are very much going to be the focus uh, really do centre on what we've discussed on this call. And, and one of the big things at Cybos is the standards forum. So being able to, to see where that conversation gets to by the end of the week is going to be a key part and, and, and a focus that I will have. And I think the other part goes to my earlier points on the systems and technology side is you know, how are we going to see the evolution of of solutions that actually empower organizations like uh, transaction manager which swift provides but you know what other solutions like that are really going to help us on this journey and to make the migrations safe and secure for us and our customers as, as we go through what are quite you know transformational events over the next two years thanks Ian. Hey. Yeah, I think, I think building on that, yeah, I'm, I'm getting in, in training for the uh, sheer size and scale of the event now as well. Um, the, the other things I'm really interested in is, is you know, in the UK and you know, within what we discuss from a ecosystem perspective, there's the, you know, the concept of market overlays. So kind of keen to see and hear what others are thinking about and ask them you know, specifically what, you know, what are their intentions in the market overlay space? Where can we drive some of the new and innovative propositions as we... Um, as we transform, not just what we do in that West, but that transformation is um, is in the UK and globally as well as um, as Ian has touched on. So that's um, that's where I'll be uh, you know, spending quite a bit of my time. You know, what's the what's the future looking like, or could look like? No, no, I'd, I'd echo both of those um, both of those um, um, perspectives. Also, in my second time in Toronto, so so looking forward and meeting many clients and partners and talking about this and, and, and many other topics affecting our industry, although I, I do expect that this will really dominate a lot of the, the dialogue and, and, and rightfully so. Um, that just leaves me to, to, to thank you both um, for, for joining the webinar. I think we've, we've really covered a lot of ground in a short space of time and a really healthy update in terms of, of what we've done, what we're seeing, um, clearly getting that sense that you know, collaboration is key in a, in a big change such as this, and it certainly supported the, 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 the smooth um, uh, and go live dates, um, and certainly is important as we go on in terms of future dates and also to, to maximize the benefits. And, um, uh, and we do feel that's a very strong and purposeful approach for ourselves here in NatWest and, and, and with everyone dialed in. So that's really, really strong message to, to get out and, and Ian, I think we, and Ed, we hear, hear you loud and clear on that front. Um, clearly lots of investment, um, investment in systems um, uh, in, uh, across the entire ecosystem. And actually, you know, what, 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 what it sounds like is that investment isn't going to stop and it's much broader, Ian, to your point, than just an investment in technology. It's, uh, it's across the entire end-to-end piece, um, which, which we need to keep doing. And I think, Aid, as, as you reference, or as we regularly talk about, it means that the payments arena is never a dull space. It's very exciting. Lots to happen, lots to happen, lots to think about, lots to leverage to really, um, really think forward and into the future. Um, and probably the fi- my final reflection is around the customer impact and the journey and the fact that this very much is a journey. And that impact is obviously being felt more by um, some, um, you know, some, some clients and institutions and corporates um, at, at now and will be 
felt by more others as the impact and the, the, the change materializes in channels and reporting and systems. Um, hopefully everyone gets a sense that NatWest is very close to being able to support that journey for everyone dialed in. Um, and therefore I would urge anyone if there are more questions or, 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 or uncertainties to, to leverage all the information that we have on the internet with regards to our ISO pages, also reaching out to your relationship managers um, to, to, to have dedicated sessions around ISO and access to a number of our SMEs. So um, the future is bright and exciting. Um, I look forward to the next one of these where I'm sure we'll have more insightful information um, and to meeting many of you soon and, and talking to you about this in more detail. But thanks Ian, thanks Aid, and, and, and thanks for joining us.